All right, guys, bear with us here. We're in the home stretch. This panel is awesome. Um, and uh, why don't we just start off by going down the line, introducing yourself, what you, uh, where you work, and, and what you do. Hi, uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I am founding partner at Venture Science. We're a seed to Series A stage um, venture capital firm. Uh, we have more of a quantitative approach to venture capital, which we'll get a little bit more into in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but we're here in San Francisco. We have an office in Palo Alto. We have more of a condensed investment model, uh, sort of the opposite spectrum of what 500 startups would do. So we write much larger checks to a smaller number of companies. So our average appetite is about um, $250,000 to a million dollars in terms of the size of the check. Um, I also write for TechCrunch every now and then, so if any of you are interested in our approach and strategy, there's a lot of information on the website, a lot of information on TechCrunch as well, but I'll be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Hello. First of all, I can't believe that we have to follow Jason. <laughs> But hi, uh, I am uh, one of the four partners at Felicis Ventures. We've been around for 10 years. It's an early stage fund uh, based in Palo Alto. We invest all across the world. Uh, uh, the current fund is about $200 million. We started with four. We've kind of like crept up over the years. We have 12 companies that are worth more than a billion dollars. We have 60 companies that have exited so far, three IPOs. Some great names in there you might have re you might recognize Shopify, Twitbit, which is a dollar share club, Boost. Um, Meraki, Twitch, you know, you kind of go down the line. But uh, we're very, very fortunate to work with amazing sets of uh, founders over the years. Uh, we have a very generalist sort of approach to things, and you know, we pick certain areas, you know, with every fund, and you know, this one, we kind of spend a lot of time in security, insurance, and AI, and uh, next generation genomics. This is really a sample. John? There's a noisy mic. Okay, my name is John Frankel, founding partner of. FF Venture Capital, New York based venture firm, seed stage. Um, so we invest when there's four people in the room, sometimes even pre revenue, um, even today. Uh, we invest in about 15 or so companies a year. Uh, check sizes are sort of from 100 to 500 initially, and then deep reserves to follow on. Uh, we're invested in Founder Suite. Um, in fact, about a third of our portfolio is on the West Coast, so when companies like uh, Surfair and Skycatch and Indiegogo, we were in Cloud. Uh, we sold to Lithium and um, uh, Lightfire, who are in, uh, also over here in uh, Rescale. Um, we, we'd like to find just incredibly talented people going after interesting problems like anyone else. The thing that's a little different about us is we bring a lot of resources to the table. So for a firm of our size, we have 29 people. Uh, so we help with recruiting, accounting, um, uh, PR, and the like. Um, uh, we have a particular, we're generalists, um, but we have a particular interest at the moment in the drone space, cybersecurity, and AI. Uh, and in fact, we announced uh, about 10 days ago a joint venture with NYU. Um, we've established the NYU FFBC um, Artificial Intelligence um, Nexus Lab, where we're taking five companies um, drawn from anywhere around the world in the AI space and looking to sort of cram a year's worth of growth in four months and leverage everything NYU brings to the table and what we bring to the table. Um, we find it kind of interesting, um, the quality of companies we started to see come through that. Um, but I'll leave the rest of that to talk about AI into question. Cool. Thank you. My name is Ariel Poller. I'm currently a full-time angel investor, I used to be an entrepreneur. Um, I do three or four investments per year, I've been doing it for almost 20 years, and tend to get pretty active, so I'm usually on three or four boards. <coughs> Some of the companies I've been most active with, I'm on the board of Strava right now, I'm on the board of Freedom Financial, was on the board of uh, StumbleUpon, Link Exchange, Odeo, um, some of my other investments, uh, Trump accounts, let's do it here, um, or Optimizely, AdMob, uh, and uh, Flickster, etc. I've done about 100 of them. And 
historically, it's been less about the space and more about my ability to help them and really liking them, liking the entrepreneurs. Uh, lately, though, I've been focusing on the space of human augmentation, so technologies that can make us superhuman. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time on that. So if any of you have an interest in that space, you want to chat about it, know anyone who's uh, into that, please let me know. Cool. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. It's uh, a little scary, actually, what you guys are helping to push forth with human augmentation and AI. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, I, I think I've seen Terminator too many times or something. But, um, you know, I want to start off. I want to kind of get a pulse on the market itself. And maybe, Ariel, we'll, we'll stick with you. You mentioned you three or four deals a year. Is that steady over the years? Is that up this year, down this year? I mean, I'd love to kind of go down, like, how many deals this year? And is it up or down from, from last year? Um, so for me, it's not absolutely, it's, it's, it's more or less the same. The one reason, it's, I mean, the truth is a little less because human augmentation is a very early stage uh, space. So it's going to take me a while for that. But if I look at big picture of the market in terms of the sense of what's going on, I'm still seeing some great deals. Um, so if I wasn't focused on that as much, I would be doing the same, the same number. And last year, I think I did six instead of four. Um, and I've done a couple of these years so far, and we're about halfway through the year. Yeah, I think. Same. Yeah, we invest in the same pace, but I think at the heart of your question is why is the market different this year than last year? And I think the why is the first six weeks in the public markets, they were down every day. And that caused everyone in the private markets to take a step back. And even though the public markets have recovered, because, hey, the Fed has eliminated the cycle. Uh, in the private markets, there's still a cycle. We have booms and we have busts. And the last couple of years have been very boomish. And this is a retrenchment. And some of the best companies are created in retrenchments. And we're seeing a lot of belt tightening you know, within our portfolio and outside of our portfolio. And I think that's ultimately very good. You know, the good people will end up working at the good companies. Um, so, you know, that's the nature of it. I think it'll last all year. Have you slowed down the number of deals this year versus the last? No. Not, not really. Um, we actually did very few deals in the first half of last year. And we couldn't really articulate why. It just, we didn't see the deals we wanted to do. And it's pick, it picked up pace really in the first half of this year. Um, so maybe we're a little bit sort of uh, uh, counter-cyclical in the way we like to invest. How about you? There was a, there's so much doom and gloom at the beginning of the year on, on kind of winter is coming and it seems that some of that chatter has abated a bit. How about you? Steady state or? So, so this year, the total amount of capital deployed out of the venture capital with let's call it, you know, in BC lingo, we call it the asset class. Out of the asset class, it's almost more than the entire amount that was deployed last year. And there are a number of reasons for that, and those are macroeconomic reasons. And when we talk about macroeconomic reasons, you need to look at three different things. The dollar, US dollar exchange rate, comparison to euros and other currencies. Uh, the interest rate, um, and finally, the inflation rate. And so the interest rate has been so close to zero, and in some certain cases negative, what happens is capital that's in the other asset classes, bonds and stocks and you know, real estate, other places, they create very little yield. And so that capital starts looking for a place to go. And just so that you guys kind of understand the mechanics of how venture capital works, that we actually raise capital just like you guys do, from outside investors. We put in our own capital as well. You know, that, that percentage varies. But it's a function of how much capital comes into the overall asset class altogether versus what goes out. So at the height of everything, it was over $100 billion. And this year, it's exceeded $40 billion. So the activity has just been unequivocal. It's almost approaching the 2001 levels. And the reason for that is that there's no returns anywhere else. And so people are looking to Silicon Valley right now to invest their money to get good returns. And we see that effect. 
Uh, now, there's a huge gap, of course, in, in, you know, the Series A crunch is still there, and there are a number of reasons for that. But overall, the market's very active, the market's very um, vibrant, and hopefully will be very fruitful as well. And we're seeing those exits all of this week. So for the rest of this year, I'll see maybe if we get another $40 billion, $60 billion, we'll be at the 2,000 loan levels. And that's great for venture capital, that's great for co-founders, great for Silicon Valley. Cindy, how about from you? You, you, coming off the dollar shape above exit, you've got to be somewhat bullish from that, right? Perhaps. Uh, what do you do? What do you do? Um, I, I think that we've never ever looked at the market you know, for guidance in which companies to invest in, and for good or bad, we don't think we're good enough to time the market. Right. So we've maintained a consistent pace all through the 2008 crisis. You know, even this year, you know, even during the peak years when people were investing more money or less money, we just roughly invested in, call it, seven to 12 companies a year. Uh, and I think that served as well because you can create great companies in every market. I, I started out saying that we have 12 companies worth over a billion dollars. We've only been in business for 10 years. So on average, we found a billion dollar company. And seven of those have exited, by the way. So these are not paper unicorns. And there's still a bunch of companies still out there that have IPO level fundamentals that might you know, either go public or get acquired depending upon you know, what happens in the market. So it really doesn't matter, right? The overall, you know, there's some changes and maybe the multiples will change, maybe your valuations will change. There'll always be money in the market. I think the bigger you know, thing to take away you know, is the macro thing you know, that, was, you know, that people keep discussing. For example, you know, I think of this as a secular 40 or 50 year you know, rise of San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Very similar to how Detroit has its you know, time in the sun, LA had its time in the sun, New York had its time in the sun, you know, with finance and, and movies and auto. What we're seeing right now is basically a 40 to 50 year, maybe we're halfway through it at this point in time. It's not gonna go away anytime soon. If you look at it, the reach of tech is only broadening. In fact, if you look at the acquirers in recent times, General Motors spent two and a half percent of its market cap on a technology company. Right? If you look at you know, Unilever buying you know, Dollar Shave Club, all of these non-traditional you know, buyers, it's not Google buying a company or Microsoft buying a company, those are still happening. But more and more you're seeing companies within Silicon Valley attacking other industries, part of the Fortune 500 companies, sometimes even creating new markets, Fitbit. And there was no incumbent you know, that owned your wrist, but they went to create a new product. So existing companies that are taking over existing markets, uh, or incumbent, taking down incumbents, or creating entirely new broad markets. So we're seeing a massive you know, increase in tech companies all over creating value everywhere. That's not gonna go away anytime soon. Just to give you a sense, we've been around for 10 years. People have been talking about boom and boom you know, for the first half of this year. We've never had this ever. We had three companies that did not have a product out in the market until January of this year. They just launched in January of this year. They're on track to hit 10 million in revenue this year. You never Can you say which companies will win? Unfortunately, yeah. not. they would kill me. But you'd never have this kind of traction before. And it's not one category. One's a consumer company, one's an SMB company, one's an enterprise company. There's, if you put the right product out there and you build something that customers want, there is more demand and more traction for it and, and a faster pro and progress rate than you can ever have in the history you know, of technology. So, yes, is it harder? It's always harder. Right? It's always been hard for different reasons. Now it's harder because anyone can build a company, so it's harder to differentiate yourself. But if you actually build something amazing, it's probably never been a better time for you to start to be a tech entrepreneur because you can really make an impact in the world and call it under five years. Look at all these other companies, I mean the Ubers and Instagrams and Snapchats or even some of the bigger companies. All of them are five, six, seven years old. When was the last time you heard of a company with like two, three, four hundred million dollars in revenue, in some cases billions of revenue, you know, any time in the history you know, of any other industry, you've never been able to make that happen. So that is the amazing part. And I know there's a lot of like, you know, doom and gloom, and you know, sometimes you can get caught up in this or the other. But I want you to sort of remember that always, is that if you want to be a tech entrepreneur, this is probably the right place and time for you to be one. Good, good positive. Any, anything to add to that, John? Or? Yeah, I mean, look, we're in a zero growth world. We're in a zero to negative interest rate world. And I think those two are linked. And we're pulling technology forward from the future. We're pulling growth forward from the future. And it's highly deflationary, which means if it's deflationary, interest rates don't go up and we're stuck in this cycle until somebody breaks it. In the interim, the growth is unevenly distributed. 
you know, Dollar Shave Club sold for a billion, which is great. Should 15% of the shaving market be only worth a billion when, you know, Procter & Gamble bought Gillette a few years ago for, the, what was the number? 68 billion. 68 billion dollars for the, what, what percentage of your market? 70%. 70%. I mean, that math doesn't work. And so what happened is we're in this zero growth world that not only is unevenly distributed, but the ability to go from zero to 10 million, you know, just hasn't been seen before. We've got another company, um, consumer, it's funny, we've, we've got one company that did 30 million in their first um, full year. It was six months and then a full year. And we just beat up the company because we think they could have done more. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so the opportunities to grow incredibly fast are out there. And we just don't think it's going to change. Think about most people, in the, not just people in this room, right? Well, early adopters we know how to spell the word tech, right? But go and look for your aunt Agatha or your you know, cousin who works in something a million miles away from this. They're spending 30% of their time on something that didn't exist 10 years ago. They're on a smartphone, they're playing a game, they're watching Netflix, they're on Facebook, they're on Pinterest. It didn't exist 10 years ago. I don't know what people are going to be doing 10 years from now, but it's going to be probably a more rapid shift than the last 10 years, because none of the things that are driving it are going to change. I see those drivers continue. Um, it's going to be really, really tough the next 10 years, because that change is going to lead to job volatility, it's going to lead to market volatility, it's going to be bigger threat to incumbents. Um, it's going to be a fascinating period. Um, so you've got a great idea, make it happen. So I read something interesting the other day, um, totally unrelated to venture or investing or anything like that. So this guy goes, did this research, and he just walked into a uh, kindergarten and he said, how many of you know how to uh, sing? And everybody, all the kids raised their hands. And, and he said, how many of you know how to dance? So all the kids raised their hands. And he said, how many of you know how to read? And only, only two kids raised their hands. So then he goes to middle school and he says, how many of you know how to read? Everybody, of course, raises their, raises their hands. He says, how many of you know how to sing? Two kids. How many of you know how to dance? One kid. So today, you know, this is, this is so typical of today's Series A stage. We have everybody, they figured out how to read. They figured out how to go after large enough markets, but rarely they are going to be the monopoly in those markets. And I think if, if you are in position to, to start a company, and if you're taking your company in a certain direction, make sure you're, you're, you're going in that direction where you're, you're going to be able to, just like how in the early stages, you know, if you're outside of an Excel, right out the door an accelerator, you know how to sing, you know how to dance, you're going to have a billion dollar market, you, you know how to do that. Series A companies, none of them talk about, tell you that story. Make sure you stick to that story and continue that way. And so that way, what that means, that translates to is creating new markets. It translates to opportunities and situations where you become monopoly, where you can set certain things. And, and these are like, think about Airbnb. Can anybody acquire Airbnb today? No. They created a market from nothing. And, 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 and this is the value that they reach. But could they acquire um, a Dollar Shave Club? Sure, every single day. So you need to decide whether you're on, down on the path to become the Dollar Shave Club, and believe me, there's a lot of components that have to fall perfectly in place to get there, or put the same sweat and tears and energy and money and everything else to become the next Airbnb. To, to us, our, our, our bet is always going to be in the newer markets, the newer you know, generation entrepreneurs go after those. So that's kind of what's going Yeah, no, so I just want to take, I don't know if it's a contrarian view, but in, in my experience, many of them have been fortunate enough to be involved with some of these super successes, and in most of the cases, it was not a big vision and, oh, look, we're gonna put a new market with it. It was a lot of luck, and a lot of luck and execution, but the execution is one step at a time. So my two cents, and I think most of you might, am I correct in assuming most of the audience is early stage entrepreneurs? So 
forget everything about the macro, so no offense, the interest rates, the big shift. Just pick something you want to do, pick something you see as an opportunity, focus on executing well. If you execute well and you get lucky, then maybe all this stuff will happen. But it's just, I've just seen so many entrepreneurs that are, oh, I'm going to do the way Twitter did it. Well, guess what? I was there, and what the book says, it's not how it happened. And, or Yahoo, or you name it. So just be a little uh, um, humble in that sense. Is if you aim to high like going baseball, you want to do the grand slam, you're going to likely strike out. You want to get it first base, you can move to second base for a bit, little by little. So when I invest, I do the same thing. I'm seeing an entrepreneur, I don't care, macro this, macro that, this space. My best investment is guys that help people that have too much credit card debt. I did this investment 13 years ago. It was never like a space that was sexy or I thought, well, guess what? Awesome team, they've grown, they're humongous. So I don't know, just be, be careful about overthinking it. That's my, my one. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, 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 quick question about that. Um, a, a lot of times what you hear is that uh, a lot of VCs will not be interested in you whatsoever unless you are swinging for the fences. So, um, would you say that your opinion is kind of informed by the fact that you're an angel investor instead of a VC? No, I mean I think that uh, if you uh, to use to stick to the baseball analogy, if it's a game where you can get to first base and that's the end of the story, then yeah, probably that's a dead end and no one is interested. But you say, look. Here's step one. But I'm playing in a big enough opportunity space where there's some lot of cool things that could happen. Um, the problem is when there's no upside. Somebody says, all I care about are ski goals. And we're going to be the best ski goal and nothing else. And forget, are you interested in other kind of goals? No. Are you interested in any kind of thing? No. Then, OK, that's too small. But the truth is, you can start with ski goals. The next thing you know, you have a big sport. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it, it's great. It's, 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 all right, let's a uh, couple more quick questions for me, and then we're going to do our flash pitches. If the folks are still ready, um, you know, let's talk about um, getting in front of you, right? Most of the folks here are interested in how to raise money. They're interested in general economic trends and you know health of the market. But really, what they want to know is what does it take to get in front of you and, and get you to cut up a cut up a check. So, or I'm going to start with you because I thought this one. I know you're a kite surfer. Um, should should one of these founders hang out at Chrissy Field with, you know, a nice hot cocoa waiting yeah, well, to you, come off the wall? Had they been there two hours ago, they could have had a private with me. But uh, my short answer is no. And here's the thing. 10, 20 years ago, you couldn't reach an investor. I mean, how do you get them? We all have emails. We all can be reached. And I think most of us are not. I read everything I get. I don't respond if I'm not interested, and I don't. I mean, I try to respond as much as I can. But I can't respond to everything, but you know, Jason was saying the same thing, which is, I don't think we're that hard to, to reach. Uh, if you put something in front of us that is compelling, then I think you stand a decent chance. The, uh, the, the mistake I see is a lot of like carpet bombing. Let me just send this generic thing, and so I, I'm not sure that works. But if if you understand me and my interests and seeing what I've spoken about and blogged about and tweeted about and made a you send me a smart pitch in an email or, or a LinkedIn message or via Twitter, what have you, um, yeah, I'll get it. As opposed to, I get some people who are disingenuous. Oh, I want to learn to kite surf. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so whoever just bought that wetsuit, take it back and move on. So yeah, let me just ask the other folks here. How many pitches do you get a day? How many email inputs or Twitter inputs? You know, how many different ideas get put in front of you a day? Just, just, just a number. I get maybe 10 to 12. 10 to 12? I think last I counted, we had 3,000 a year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're a similar number. Less than 10. Less than 10 then. So the least here is 10 a day. Now, we all have day jobs, we have portfolio companies, some of us raise funds, you know, the teams to talk with, etc. The ability to sit down and absorb 10 different businesses and try and understand and sit through them is literally an impossible task. So when you, when you email someone, try and give them the pieces they need. And one of the people was up here earlier, they said, I never send a day. 
Well, I gotta tell you. And that's a new trend. We're, we're yeah. seeing that more and more now. Yeah, and I tell people, you don't send me a track, you don't send me a deck, I don't take a meeting. Because I'm not gonna cut out a half an hour of my day for 10 people to 20 people to work out if I want to take half an hour. I've got to be able to condense it down and quickly get to a quick no or a quick yes to take that meeting. And, it's, and that's the problem we have. And I've got to tell you, if it's 10, it's not going to 5. It's 10 going to 20. And I don't know how to resolve this problem. Um, you know, this, uh, this um, joint venture we're doing with NYU, we're going to get like 300 applications for five spaces. And we're going to give them even more attention than we'd normally do. But that's 300 business plans and teams in all different types of business to evaluate, to find the five. Right? That is the normal thing we have to do. So make it easy. Right? Look at our portfolios. Look at the stage we invest. Look and, and see. Don't come to me if you're looking for a $10 million check. Right? Don't come to me if you're looking for someone to invest in a play. Right? Don't come to me if it's you know biotech. Right? Look it up. For, don't come to me if it's a competitor with Indiegogo because we're in Indiegogo and we're not going to invest in a competitor. Right? It's easy to work those things through and filter it out, and you'll, you will have a better time with it, and the better chance that we'll be able to respond. But we are drowning in email, drowning in messages coming in of people who just want to grab that 20 minutes coffee. And I, it's very tough to say no. And so the best thing is to say nothing, right? You just don't respond, because how can you? But you kind of want to. And that's, that's the quandary we're in. Um, in, in how we have to deal with pitches. Jimmy, how about you? Places, given their successes must have just overflowing in buses, how do you process it? Do you? We, we struggle with it like everyone else. I don't think there's a simple solution to it. Uh, but one of the things, I think John hit the nail on the head, the most important thing you can do is uh, try to make sure that you understand what you can invest in and make it custom and, and make it relevant, right? And I think, I caught the tail end of you know a couple of other uh, founders that were talking about their hacks. You know there were some interesting points in there, but if you blast you know some of those emails and just trying to like make sure that you have coverage but you have no, no relevance, I think that can you know, go wrong as well. So and we see this all the time. You kind of see it. sometimes you know it's not even my name; it's someone else's name. It's just the wrong interface here, and you know we see this like you know amateur hour all the time. So I, I think the most important thing you can do is really get to understand what people are actually looking for. And people have their biases. Don't get me wrong, and no one even here you know, invests in the same things. You might, you might all look at the same you know, company and have very, very widely different opinions. You know, someone might write you a turn sheet on the spot, and then another person might not you know, invest in you even after you show three years worth of traction. Right? It's just we're all human beings. We all have their biases. We all have companies that we've invested in that have done really well. You know, other companies that have not done well, sometimes they're more gun shy in areas where we haven't you know, had success in and much more enthusiastic in places where we've helped, you know, a company, you know, reach success. So it's some of that is hidden in our heads. Some of that, you know, comes out, you know, in our portfolio, comes out in our about pages, comes out in our bios, and you know, that's probably the, the best thing. And in terms of actual tactics in reaching us, the best thing probably is to find someone who knows us because you know chances are you probably have someone in your network who has a connection in. And that's probably the best way to get hold of us because it's easier for me to ignore an email if it's just a cold email. You know, you could just guess my email address. I'm sure you find five different variations. You can probably get through. Uh, and chances are the hit rate is going to be very low unless it's very, very targeted and it's something that I'm really looking for. But chances are if you find another founder or another investor or someone else in my network, it's going to be very hard for me to say no. So I will at least respond you know, in some fashion and will say why it's not a fit if it's not a fit. Uh, but you'll at least get a response. So the best thing is to actually go through someone. Hey Matt, final question, then we'll do our flash pitches. Uh, you're data-driven VC, a little different, so tell us your process for filtering deal flow. Yeah, so um, we, obviously what's going to resonate with us is uh, you know, if you provide some 
numbers behind, you know, here's the market that I'm going after. This market is this big worldwide. Um, we're interested in that. We're interested in markets. We're interested in interest rates. We're not interested in fairy dust, you know, no disrespect, whatever else, you know. We're interested in solid, actual analysis of what it is that you're doing, what market you're going after. Do you have any traction? Tell it to us. Um, and, 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 you know, we'll, we'll take a look at it. And for instance, you know, we, we've done analysis, uh, you know, we, we've narrowed it down to elements such as how many co-founders are in the company. We've analyzed thousands of companies and we've discovered that it's actually the best thing is a three co-founder company. And that's about 6% more likely to succeed than in a two single founder company and more than four co-founders. So, um, you know, we, we, we break down your, your addressable market into if it's less than 10 billion, 10 to 30, 30 to 50. 1,500, however much me, but we want to see numbers, and, and, and if I were you, I would sit down and really just try to make sense out of the markets, try to make sense out of the numbers, so so that it, it makes sense to the person that you're talking to. Now, you know, this could be outside your personality, maybe you'd like to paint more of a um, sort of an emotional story, then, then you should approach those types of VCs, but our... Our, you know, policies, we, we actually respond to every email that comes in, you know, some of those people in this room emailed me, and if you haven't gotten a response, please come grab me here. Um, but we respond to every email, we, we read through that. If it's if it's too crazy, we, we, we send a single sentence response to say, this is not for us. Uh, if, if I have a little bit more time, I might write a little bit more. But one quick tip for you guys, if, you know, how many of you guys are familiar with Sidekick or, or HubSpot? Okay, if you use Sidekick's Gmail add-on, the moment you type in somebody's email address, on the right side of your screen, it'll show sort of like a brief profile of that person. It'll kind of under the covers, and I don't know how legal this is, but it'll, they do this. It'll verify that email address, and it'll show you with 90% of the time it works. So use HubSpot, put the email address, hit the tab, and see if anything pops up. And if it does, then boom, you know, you got a valid email. Send out an email, if you get a response, great, continue. If you don't, you don't. Aaron, did you have some? Uh, or John? Yeah. So, I mean, there's one other thing I want to share with you. And this is something we find in 60% plus of the meetings we have with entrepreneurs that they find it very difficult to do. They can't describe what their business does. Mm -hmm. you know, don't come in and say it's the A, A for B, you know, the Uber for breast implants or whatever it is, right? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I got that this morning. <laughs> That's yes. an aerial pitch, right? That's an aerial pitch. can't go down that right now. So, so don't describe it as A for B. Take out every buzzword, and if you're trying to explain it to someone who's not in the tech industry with simple language, four-year-old language, what do you do? You know, what's Founder Suite? It's a suite of tools for founders to help them get shit done, right? Simple to explain what the business is. The businesses you can't explain become really problematic even if they're successful, because you think you're building this, everyone else on your team thinks they're building something a little different because th their articulation is different. Your founders have a different view. Uh, sorry, not your founders, your, your investors have a different view. Your new employees coming on. If you can't articulate clearly what you're doing, it will create like any currents of noise around the growth you're trying to put together. Awesome. All right, we, you, you've uh, suffered through the heat for long enough. We're going to do a couple flash pitches, and then we'll be done. We can, uh, Just one done. quick thing I want to add. Always use proper language. Always maintain a certain decorum throughout your entire exchange with your investors. Don't drop the F-bomb. Don't MF nothing, anything like that. It doesn't come across right. Be nice, be, be, you know, just maintain a nice property for <laughs> Hey, I have a lot of people in Silicon Valley that don't use the airport. I don't use it. No, 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 the series, sorry. Oh. 
you said that's in the movies. No, no, let's ask a personal favor. One of the organizers, my wife is downstairs trying to come up and she can't. If there's someone from the organizers I can try to get her up, I would appreciate it. Thank you.